Yes, thanks, Brian. Um, first of all, let's just introduce a few of the key people into the Central Region DOS Development Team and, and also the Headquarters DOS Development Team. I'm going to say DOS from here on out, Digital Aviation Services, DAS. But anyway, here at um, Milwaukee Sullivan, we have Jerry Wiedenfeld. He's the ITO here. What he did was he took a lot of, he took all of the tools already developed for DOS, and he, what I call, deratized it and made it, made it very um, accessible to us forecasters and made it in a way that it was just really easy to use. He also added con short and gridded verification. So we owe a lot of the Central Region Digital Aviation Services effort to Jerry Wiedenfeld. Also a forecaster here at MKX, Denny Van Cleve. He's the, he's the GFE focal point, and he did a lot of work with the formatters and also a lot of the smart tools and getting it all packaged into one. At Central Region, Brian, he's the aviation program leader among many other hats, and he has been working closely with Jerry and I to make this uh, be developed for all of Central Region. Jeff Craven, the SSD chief, has been a, a big advocate for this, and he's liking what he sees and getting it going through all of Central Region. And Cami Sims, I know she's on the line. She's going to say a few words. But she's the project lead of digital aviation services at the National Weather Service headquarters level. So just to make it clear, this is not just a regional effort or a local office effort. This is all of the National Weather Service, it, um, a portion of the effort for digital aviation services. Cami, are you on the line? I am here, Marsha. Thanks. OK. Um, with I'll go ahead and just introduce a few things. So as Vasha pointed out, um, Cami Sims, so I work in aviation services at headquarters and in the new organization, if you're still trying to get a hold of that, I know we all are. Um, it's in the Analyze, Forecast, and Support. So we support the policy and require service headquarters level. So as Marsha pointed out, um, this is part of an overarching project um, at the national level. And so I'm the project lead on that. And um, Central Region has put together a, a really good package for you guys uh, to download and install at your office. And Marshall will go through a really good process of um, how to do that. So she has a lot of good tidbits for you today. Um, some of the questions and comments that you know we get a lot at the national level um, are in relation to the mountainous areas and if there's a lot of feedback and so forth from that and how the tools work and so forth. And so one thing that I really want to highlight today is your feedback and your input that you guys provide to Central Region um, is not only beneficial for Central Region, but it's also beneficial for the national project um, because we are rolling it out at the national level. That's one of the things that I'm working on with all of the regions is implementing digital aviation services um, on their timeline. Uh, also, I would like to highlight that Aviation Services has been funding uh, Global Systems Division, GSC, in Boulder to um, Im improve upon the task formatter. And uh, they've made a lot of headway on that in the past year. And I would say in the next six months, they've, they're doing a tremendous amount of effort in providing smartness into those formatters. So in the next six months or so, there'll be a lot of development and improvements to the task formatter from what you see today. Um, the next iteration is going to be coming out in late February, and I believe Jerry is going to put that into a nice pretty package for all of you guys um, that's going to come out in the March time frame. Um, let's see. So the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, like I said before, uh, feedback is imperative. I know as a forecaster, I've been in the WSO level myself. And sometimes we, we do things, too, um, that will just get the forecast out the door right now. But I would like um, folks in my plea to you is let us know that feedback. Let us know when things don't work, what the, forecast, what the formatter gives you that you were not expecting or it didn't work in the way that you thought it should. All of that is going to help the overall health of the project. And um, one last plug is we do have a digital aviation services user group and a listserv, list so to speak. 
If you would like to be a part of that user group, we have teleconferences every other week on Tuesday afternoon. Um, or if you'd like to be on that Digital Aviation Services email group and you're not currently, please send me an email and I will get you added. So with that, I will give it back to Marsha and uh, let her take it from here. Thanks, Marsha. All right, thanks, Cami. I think we covered everything on our first slide. It's already been implemented in a lot of places. Central region as well. I know Jackson, Kentucky has been using it, and then Marquette, Michigan, too. And like Cami talked about, is GSD, Global Systems Division out of Boulder. They're tasked with the development of the formatters and a lot of improving a lot of the tools. So we're going to forward anything that we get onto them as, as we see fit. So we've come a long way so far. You guys are getting into the Central Region DOS effort kind of uh, after we've polished a lot of things, although there's still more to work on. Um, so just keep sending us your feedback. I'm going to be giving you at the end of the the talk shows, okay, where are all of the information that we can go look at in order to reference Central Region DOS. I made, I have a CR DOS folder. It's a Google Drive shared with you guys, and I'll show you where to find it. There's also some documentation available. So anything that I gloss over in this short presentation today, you can find more details in it. I'm just going to gloss over some motivation. Bottom line, the reason for digital aviation services is consistency. We already do GFV forecasts for the public, marine, and fire weather elements. We're just simply adding a missing component, aviation. This satisfies the FAA's next-gen requirements. They want the National Weather Service. Um, we want to be a single authoritative source for weather information, and they would like to have five national digital elements, ceiling and visibility being two of them that the weather service offices, forecast offices could provide. The DOS effort ties right in with the ESTF, Enhanced Short-Term Forecast Effort, and I guess the phrase has been coined as enhanced digital services from the headquarters level. So besides the FAA needing this, the Aviation Weather Center in Kansas City would like this information. They're discontinuing their text for area forecast, so this will be very useful in that, in, in that product. Emergency medical services, search and rescue, a lot of these customers, they've been wanting this information for a long time, especially the general aviation community, where they would like weather forecast information in between the TAF sites, aviation forecast. Also, the drones are gaining more attraction now, and it would be a good thing for them, too. So the big picture would be consistency. We'd have consist consistency between tasks and our other products, such like the winds are going to match what's in your task, your winds in your grid, match the task, your uh, sky cover would match the task, things like that. We, we are accountable for these things. Um, DOS is going to make that just a little bit easier. Eventually, we'll have consistency between the offices, and our ceiling of visibility information will be available at all points in, anywhere in a domain to our customers. So what is Central Region DOS? All right, well, you all have cons short for a lot of the weather elements. Now what Jerry did was he added aviation weather elements into the cons short. You're going to find there's two main elements we're going to be editing, cloud-based primary and visibility. We also made a tool, Aviation Populate, which is a streamlined way to put Consort into our forecast out to 30 hours. And then we can run Aviation Finalize, which combines a lot of tools into one procedure where it does all the QC things that you need. There's a task formatter. and we used to have visibility in our weather grids, but now we don't have to have that anymore. The TAF formatter is able to read our visibility grids directly. Jerry made an ob observation grid, um, and that helped us make the gridded verification. 
So I'll get all into all of that in this presentation. All right, the two grids that we forecasters are concerned with are cloud-based primary and visibility. What we typically do is just start with what Consort gives us and find ways where Consort needs to be improved. Um, now, we have a ceiling group, but that's actually just a calculated group. It takes your sky cover and your cloud-based primary, and it's really just concerned with your sky cover that's greater than 60%. And the ceiling grid is what is get sent to NDFD. The visibility grid stands alone, and that is also sent to NDFD. Now, your task formatter reads cloud-based primary, not your ceiling. These are just little things that you'll get to know as you get into DOS more in your office. And what you'll find is you're going to get tasks that are consistent with your grid. All right, so the task formatter uses winds and gusts, pops, weather and sky, and the two new weather elements, cloud-based primary and visibility. As you can see here, this is some example output of what the task formatter might give you. And there are a lot of lines. But I find that it's a lot easier to delete lines than add them. What we do is we pull this into AVN FPS, and we edit it as necessary, and then we send it out, just like what we normally do. So that's something that does not change. We use AVN FPS. We have regular task issuance times. You still can write your temp. You still are doing short-term variability amendments manually as well. So what changes? You have two new grids to compose and edit. And you can write tempo groups, although that part is still experimental. The biggest change is your grids are going to be always consistent with your tasks. And the best thing about it is you're going to have less hand editing. The tasks are going to get done maybe a little quicker. But best of all, you're going to have a lot of your grids done earlier in the shift. That's the part I like the best. Now for aviation procedures, um, these are all, there's like five of them that we put in the populate menu, all preceded by the word aviation so that they're lumped together. Aviation populate and finalize are two I'm going to go into. I will, I'll touch on all of them in this PowerPoint presentation, but if you want any more information, there is documentation for that. And for con short, the, for the aviation weather elements, we have just a little bit different model composition that goes into it than what some of the other weather elements use. And it's laid out here in this table. The, the models in bold are the ones that have a little higher weight. The high, they have higher temporal resolution, and they verify really well. So Jerry was able to weight them just a little heavier. Okay, so implementing DOS into Central Region, you know, we came up with some sort of informal timeline, and we want, to, want you to know this is going to be a gradual process. Adapting DOS into your everyday operations isn't going to happen overnight, and so we kind of broke it down into steps. A lot of offices, a lot of people out there, you probably have never even looked at your aviation weather element groups or grids or models that are available in GFE. Um, some of you may not have had it installed until just last week. The tech note was due on the January 22nd. But now that you have it installed, I want you to just take a look at what's available. This would be step one here. We can go, you can go through GFE, you explore your model data, you're going to see that Consort populated your cloud-based primary and your visibility forecast in the background. And when you're composing your tasks, you might want to glance at the model data that's in GFE, the gridded data. That might help you make your tasks. Just visually, you're not going to be doing any gridded twiddling or anything. But take a look at it, and I think it might actually help you. One thing you might notice is the models are probably better than what you were expecting. At least that's what I found. When I was first going into DOS, I'm like, how are the models going to perform? I don't have a lot of confidence in them. I feel like they don't do that well. Well, after being with DOS for quite a while, I find that the models do perform really well. 
You just have to know when you can use them, when you can trust them, and they verify well. As, as you will find out, we have help for you. All right, so once you get comfortable exploring the model data with that, with step one, go ahead and try loading what's generated in your TAF formatter into ABNFPS and try using that as a starting point for when you're doing your, your TAF. You'll find that it gives you, at, at a minimum, some lines that parse out when your wind, major wind changes are, and maybe when you have some big ceiling changes as well. During step two, the consort is going to run in the background every six hours if your office is not, if not everyone is on board quite yet. Just, but you can, you can go in and you can make edits to your grids and then run the TAF formatter, see, see what it gives you. And, you know, at some point, if, if you can get a lot of people on board in your office, after your office will go through the local, uh, the lot process, um, you can, as an office, move on to step three. That turns off the automation in the background, so then the whole office will populate manually with con short uh, by running the aviation populate procedure. Now there's still some checks built in, and you get a banner if your aviation grids are old after five and a half hours saying, hey, aviation populate's going to run in the background if, if your grids are old. And, you know, that's fine. A lot of people just let it happen. But this is where you're going to want to find, look, find times that you can improve upon con short output. And there are some. There are lots of opportunities. We know that con short doesn't do as well in convective scenarios. But it does really well in the IFR, MVFR scenarios. So you'll find the pros and cons of it and when you want to add value. All right, then you run your aviation finalize. That does all the QC checks for you. It can publish for you if you want. You run your task formatter. You load it into ABN FPS. You make your minor edits for it, and you send it out. That's all in the experimental step, step three. And once your office gets really comfortable with this step, then you move, then you just declare yourselves as operational, where you're actually sending your your ceiling and visibility grids to NDFD and point and click. You're routinely using DOS in your office. Um, one of the goals for fiscal year 17 for Central Region is for the Central Region, Do um, Central Region offices to all become operational with DOS. This is going to be a slow implementation process, but this phone call or this uh, webinar is just to get you guys looking at what's available. I know several central region offices that have been working with DOS for the last few months have very positive reviews on it once they're getting to know it. And people in our office, these are for, from four forecasters in the Milwaukee Sullivan office, um, the, the response was very good. And and uh, I think that'll happen as you guys get more used to it, too, in your offices. This is an example of what, we, what is sent to NDFD in the hourly, um, hourly forecast for graphical forecast. And in this case, we had some valley fog in our forecast for visibility. There's also an hourly weather graph. I grabbed these images to demonstrate how it would work to a customer expecting snow spreading into their area. So I did the point for Milwaukee, the hourly weather graph. At, and so you look at 10 p.m., and if I look at the NDFD graphics at 10 p.m., I can see the, that the snow, well, the lower ceilings and visibilities are going to be spreading in from the west during the late evening and overnight, and then they're going to come down during the overnight hours and improve by the afternoon the next day. So this is just an example of what your users might see. All right, I'm sure there's a question burning in all of your minds. What about collaboration? The Central Region Gridded Methodology and Advisory Team, they've been tasked to develop the thresholds and guidelines, and that'll be used to decide on collaboration stuff over the next year. 
But here's the thing. For central region, we're, we're all starting with a common starting point. Right now it's come short. This is going to set us up for some really good things in the future. Um, one, it, it will help us have an easier collaboration with neighbors. That will be similar to the extended, however the CRG mat decides it, it should be. But it's also going to set us up for some changes at the national level. Uh, you know, if we need to go to national blender model as our starting point, fine. We're already using Consort as a starting point. There's talk about the Aviation Weather Center making ceiling and visibility grids for the weather forecast offices as a starting point. If that happens, we would be ready. So we're all, we've got the framework in place and we're ready for whatever comes down the line next. All right, so when you go in to make your uh, aviation grids, well, first of all, you've got to make sure your other grids are up to date. Your sky cover, you're going to want to pay attention to the cutoff point at uh, 61%. That's what's going to determine where your scattered and broken ceilings are. Your winds are obviously going to be a, a factor. And your pops, we have a little cutoff set up, well, it's been set up for a long time, of 46% or greater. That's when your weather type would, would come and show up into your TAF formatter. Anything smaller than that would probably not show up. Um, and then your weather types, there's aviation finalized that will help determine some of the weather types that can add fog. I'll go into a little bit of that next. All right, but there's a lot of things that go into your TAF formatter. Sometimes it doesn't give you exactly what you want. As Cami said, well, if, it, if it's not giving you what you want, we need to notify GSD, and they can help make improvements to the TAF formatter at the national level. But you also need to understand there's a lot of rules that go into it, and it's an, a computer algorithm. Sometimes it doesn't take everything literally what you'd expect from your grids. And uh, that's why we do some post editing before we send it. You should, you should be writing your tasks by flight category, not exactly what you're expecting to see in the METARs. And uh, you're just going to need to practice and get to know what the formatter can do and what it can't do. You also might notice that there are three extra groups available in your aviation weather element groups. The, they can be left blank. They're optional. And a little bit about what they can do. That cloud-based secondary, you can add like a lower scattered group to some broken ceiling height. Basically, you can add like some level of coverage down one level from what you already are. And then the cloud-based conditional, visibility conditional, that is in, the intention of those are to create tempo groups in your task. That part's still experimental. Again, DSD is working to improve that. But you can still work with it at this time. All right, so I'm going to pause. This is one of two pauses in the middle of the presentation that we're going to have time for question and answer at the end. So we can just take a couple questions. Brian will, will uh, you'll just need to raise your hand, and Brian will take over from here. And then um, I'm here to answer just a couple questions before we move on to the actual grid editing tools. Okay, well, um, I sent out a message to everyone and asked if they would raise their hand if they had a question. And at this time, I see uh, I see no hands uh, raised um, except for, oh, there we go. Katie, I have un, uh, I have unmuted your phone. Do you have a question? I do, Brian. We are sitting here wondering if, if uh, the terrain differences have been considered for this project. Katie, Katie um, um, yeah, there are, we have been, okay, we live in a flat area. So where we've been developing this, we haven't had a lot of terrain issues to deal with. We have a river valley, and we have edit areas to handle fog in the river valley. Um, so the terrain 
the high terrain areas, that's where we're going to need your feedback and showing us what's going on. And we're going to be looking closely at your verification and listening to your problems just to improve the tools. Which office are you at? Uh, we are at the Riverton, Wyoming office. OK, thanks, Katie. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. And Katie, you should know that we did have a number of uh, uh, folks on yesterday's call from uh, Grand Junction uh, and um, and I believe Boulder or or uh, or Pueblo. And so this was uh, this was also a subject then, um, but they're still taking a look at it. And the idea is that the the more offices we have looking at it, the the more uh, questions we'll have, and then the more answers. So um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Jeremy, I see you have a question as well. Go ahead. Well, this is Scott in Goodland. Uh, we had a question come up here uh, wanting maybe a little bit better explanation between uh, what the differences are between a, a primary and secondary cloud heights and then what the difference is between that and if there is a distinction between that and the ceilings. OK, yeah, I can clarify on that. OK, you're going to be dealing with cloud-based primary the most. And that is just going to determine what your cloud bases are. And your ceiling is determined by taking your cloud-based primary and your sky coverage percentage that you put in. Your ceiling is only used by NDFD, not your TAF formatter. Cloud-based secondary is completely is a little bit separate. Your TAF formatter can read cloud-based secondary. And you know what? This is what I would use it for. Um, you know how we have hints in our TAF where we might, there, we're thinking, oh, there could be some lower cloud group sneaking in overnight, but we're just not sure. We don't want to put a, them at a ceiling, right? Or a ceiling that low. So what we, what we might want to do is you're going to have say, high, high sky cover, say 80%, and maybe the cloud base would be 3,500. But you want to hint that there would be a 1,500-foot cloud base possibility. So you'd put a scattered, or a few 1,500, actually it would be scattered 1,500, broken 3,500 in this example. If you wanted that 1,500 to be there, you would just put a, a short time range in your cloud-based secondary group of 1,500 feet. And then your TAF formatter would read that, and it would put that scattered lower group beneath your broken group, or right in front of it. Does that make sense, my example? I think it does. I think we'll have to practice that a little bit, but uh, I think I think that'll help out. Um, one other question that I had was uh, related to when the uh, con short is populated. Um, is there a time during the hour that it's being populated that uh, we are unable to use that? And because uh, it seems like there are some times where we're seeing some errors in the formatter, and we look down and the uh, uh, the grids are being populated at that time. Is there a consistent time when the contour is being populated where we can't use the tab formatter? Well, the. It's the it's really the the tool that populates um, the forecast grids. So the time time range that um, count 50 after the hour, and it's um, usually done about five after the the next hour. So it takes about 15 minutes for count short to run, and then um, at the TAF issuance times, that's when. Um, con short, it would run about an hour before that time frame, or not con short, the, the population tool would run about an hour before that time frame. And that's when your forecast grids wouldn't necessarily be available because they would be getting populated by con short grids. So yeah, there is probably a, I mean, that, that process takes maybe um, two minutes at most once, once they're actually being populated. Um, so. It, during that time frame, if you were to run the formatter, then it would probably it would have a problem. Um, but other than that, it should be fine. Um, I I don't have the exact time ranges in front of me right now. Um, um, I believe they're in the 16Z time frame um, is when they actually populate. But I'd have to look at that. 
to get the exact time for you. Okay, thanks. That'll help out. Yeah, that's what I meant was uh, populating the grids, not necessarily running the tap for matter. But yeah, that explains it. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I don't see any other hands up at this time. Uh, last call on questions, otherwise we'll move along. There'll be uh, a couple more spots where we'll stop and ask questions as well. Oh, I do have one. Last last question here. Um, uh, Jackson, is, is that you again, Ed, or someone else from Jackson today? It's a bunch of us. I've got a question for you on your conditional sky for the scattered group. Does that require, uh, or does that depend on the sky percentage as well, or does that just show up automatically if there's a grid there? That just shows up automatically if there's a grid there. Okay, so it shows up automatically. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just experiment with it. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I can't give you like really specific instructions on it. There's the bottom line is there's no sky threshold for the scatter to show up. That's correct. I mean, one more example for that is if you, if your sky cover is giving you scattered and you have something in your cloud-based secondary group, um, that is going to actually give you a few before your scattered group in your task. So it's just letting you go one category down. And that's the only logic, I mean, it's that's the only logic that's in it. It can't do like few with a broken ceiling. It can just do one category lower. That's how it's written in the code. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marsha, um, please continue. All right, thanks. So we're going to move into looking at the GFE tools and how to edit the grid. What your purpose for doing the edits is to look for opportunities to approve upon con short and make those small changes and then move on to making your task. All right, so for this, for this example, maybe con short populated with this into my GFC. If I think it's unrepresentative, I'm going to edit the, edit some grids. So we are all expert grid editors, right? We use it every day in GFE. We know how to manipulate the grids to the way we need them. So you're going to apply the same concept for aviation weather elements. You can copy other models directly into your aviation weather element forecast grid. You can use the area select tool and edit some part of it. Uh, maybe a scalar vector tool or some sort of model blending tool would be useful. Pencil tool if you have to. A lot of times if I have feelings that are going to be deteriorating over time. Maybe I would delete some intermittent grids and interpolate later. That's what Aviation Finalized can handle interpolation. You know, when you're doing your, your cloud-based primary grids, one thing you need to remember that makes your life a lot easier is that you only need to decide on what your prevailing ceiling height is, not your coverage. Remember that your sky grids determine your coverage. So we're, let's say we're doing a, have a diurnal cumulus day, but we're expecting more clouds in one area than another. So we want like a broken ceiling in part of my CWA and a scattered ceiling in the other part. Your sky cover determines scattered versus broken, but on like a diurnal Q day, you're probably going to have the same cloud bases. So you would just populate the whole grid with say 5,000 for your cloud base primary. Um, that just makes life easier if you can remember that concept. That's just a diff little different way of, work of working with the aviation grids. It's also something that the models don't do. So when you're manipulating grids, you'll just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so aviation finalized, like I said, there are a lot of tools rolled into it, and I'm going to illustrate some of them to you. There's a tool called Ceiling from Cloud-Based Primary and Sky. So for this example, in my top left, I have a sky grid. And the southwest half of it has sky cover less than 61% or scattered group. My cloud-based height, I have drawn in here um, kind of the left-hand left side of this image. You see it, uh, anything, it, whatever I put in there is fine, but what this 
what this tool does is it will mask out where your sky cover was less than 61%, regardless of what your cloud-based height says. And that determines what your ceiling grid is. Your ceiling grid is what is sent to NDFD. Okay, so if you had sky cover less than 61%, no matter what the height was, it's going to be set to negative 30,000. That's some arbitrary value that NDFD can see to define a non-ceiling. All right, so that's one tool that is in there. Here's another one, QC visibility with pop and weather. So the top left panel, in the southwest part of it, I have pops less than 55%. And my visibility grid in the top right is showing that I have some speckles of lower visibility, lower than seven miles. Okay, this tool, when it's run in the background and finalized, it's going to actually set my visibility to be seven miles. So it's also you know, checking against your weather grid. In this example, I have chance of snow because it pops less than 55, but I don't have any fog mentioned. Remember in the task, we write BR, right? If we're thinking like five mile, by a five SM BR, if there's no weather involved. So you'd have to have fog in your weather grid in order for the task formatter to pick up on the BR. In this case, we have snow, but it's not like mentionable for your task formatter according to the 55% there. And so you don't have fog, so then it's going to mask out your visibility, and it's also not going to show up in your task formatter. All right. I'm going to stop for just a second because a lot of you are having the aviation populate, aviation finalize running in the background. And this is in part step one and or step one and step two of our DAS process of central region. So when that's running automatically in the background, we kind of took off this check that goes on because we don't we want you to be able to see your visibilities when they're low, even if your weather doesn't match. One caveat is when you run the task formatter, there's another check built into that, and it's not going to be your low visibilities that are in your grid. So I'll just all I'm going to say on that. Okay, one other tool of ceiling from cloud-based primary and sky. In this case case where the tops are greater than or equal to 55%. I have cloud-based primary set here at, it says 150, it's 15,000 for really, for high pops, right? Well, this QC check says, well, you probably shouldn't have that high of a ceiling if you're expecting high pops. And so it will set it down to 9,000 feet. All right, there's another function here, clean cloud height. So as you notice in the top left, this is where I maybe hand edited or this is what ConShort gave me. It's, it's a not rounded values of, of cloud-based primary. In the bottom right, this is after finalize has taken a hold of it. And it, you can see it rounded the numbers to some number within the middle of the flight category. So for this 900 value in the top left, it changed it to 700 after clean cloud, clean cloud height was applied. Categorized visibility does something similar with your visibility grid. All right, and then included into your finalized procedure, aviation finalized, there's this fog from visibility. Here I've, I set the defaults just a little different um, from what they were. But anyway, you can also run this tool separately from Aviation Finalize, but I like running it with Aviation Finalize. It makes it easy. But say we're expecting kind of widespread lower visibilities, maybe that morning fog in the fall season or something. Um, you, would, you just want fog to be put into your weather grids based on what you have in your visibility. This tool can do it for you. All right, there's a tool that you can run separately, cloud-based primary from R8. Remember I said ConShort doesn't do very well in like the daytime convective situations or diurnal cumulus clouds. You know, when you're determining cloud bases on diurnal Q days, you're probably looking at buff kit or similar things. 
what this tool will do is kind of act as its an eyes on buff kit. You can, you can use whichever models or model blend you'd like. Then you can use the slider bar to adjust the sensitivity of the relative humidity. And you can run this tool multiple times just to figure out what works for you, what gives you what you want. But this would be a way to set your cloud-based primary. Um, remember your sky cover percentages. Determine if it's scattered, broken, overcast, or whatever. So it's a useful tool. We like it. All right. Um, showers and isolated thunderstorms. The task formatter has some rules for how it deals with thunderstorms. Bottom line is like the first couple of hours, as long as your pops are high, it'll put prevailing thunderstorms in there. In the outer periods of the task, it might mention VCTS or not even at all if your pops are lower. And this is all in the documentation to refer back to. So we have just a quick example here with uh, showers and thunderstorms moving west to east across southern Wisconsin in May. And I'm moving forward here just slowly. But on the back side of this convection, there are actually some low ceilings and low visibilities building in. So this is our aviation weather, uh, forecasting concern. And when we're looking at the forecast of it, like gridded forecasts, come short, put this forecaster, or forecast in, the one in the top left. And the forecaster who was on shift was thinking, you know what, I think the ceilings are going to be a little lower than what Conshort is giving in our southwest. So what he ended up doing was blending Conshort with the adjusted lav, and that gave him the lower ceilings, the ones that he was expecting. That's one way to edit grids. Also for the same scenario, he thought the, the visibilities needed to be lower in our southeast. So he was able to blend some models together as well in order to get the forecast that he wanted. All right, we do have a low-level wind shear tool that is run, that can be run separately from what Aviation Populate does. Aviation Populate will actually put in the con short version of low-level wind shear. That is simply blending the NAM, GFS, and RUC-13. The thing is, models don't have the smart init to the low-level wind shear, so we can use this procedure to um, just calculate it by hand or by individual model, but the output is oftentimes spotty, especially construct because you're depending on three models to have good agreement on some on low-level wind shear. In this scenario, uh, the forecaster edited both the low-level wind shear and the low-level wind shear height grids for just the time period that they're expecting low-level wind shear. You as a forecaster know when that time period is. It's not every day that you're dealing with this. So by, on a case-by-case -case basis, you'll probably determine what would you write in your task. Then you just draw it in. You could use um, a pickup value function to have a uniform grid or you know, whatever editing tools you'd want to do. And then your task formatter would spit out something like this, where it has the wind shear in there, just how you'd want it, not maybe not exactly how you'd want it. So an edited version might pare that down a little bit. All right, so now we're going to take a break. And after this little break, we're going to go into um, verification and, and another example. So anyone have any uh, short questions before we get on to the last part of our talk? We have just a couple of hands raised. Um, first, I'd like to go to um, to Indy. Did you have a question? I've unmuted your line. Okay, um, John Kowalski, are you on? Okay. Um, any other uh, any other questions? Just raise your hand. Jamie, I've un I've unmuted your line. Thanks, Brian. Marsha, uh, 
we've been playing with the aviation finalized a little bit here in Chicago. And are there any plans, like for, uh, like you mentioned, if the pot's less than 55%, the visibility will be, let's say, sevened out, so it's not really zeroed out, so it's just changed to seven. Where if you still have snow, let's say less than 55%, you still may have a visibility risk. I guess it doesn't show up in the TAF, but I'm a little concerned that 55, just the visibility, if it's less than 55, the visibility gets turned to seven. Um, is there is there any talk about maybe getting rid of that or adjusting it? Jamie, uh, the, the thresholds of POPs came up a lot yesterday after our call as well. And so this is going to be something we are going to need to be looking at as a development team on these thresholds and also kind of making it uh, available to edit at your local level a little easier. So we'll stand by with that question. We'll get back to you on that as soon as we kind of figure out what to do with that, okay? Hey, as long as you guys are looking at it and it's not concrete, I'm a happy camper. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. And at the present time, I have no other hands up. Last call. Otherwise, we're going to go uh, ahead and there'll be one more uh, chance for questions. All right, Marsha, please. All right, thank you. Okay, so we know that the models have quite a wide range of solutions. We can look through them, see where they differ, and knowing now what goes in on short and how it's weighted, what kind of confidence we can put into our con short. So you can step through the individual models in GFE. Kind of, uh, I'm used to doing it this way, but there's another way too. You could create six nine or 12 panel procedures in D2D that can compare the GFE gridded data, gridded model output, and you can look at it all at the same time. What Denny did here at our office, um, kind of like overload here, but eventually we'll have bigger monitors and can handle 12 panel, G 12 panel D2D procedures. But just know that you can configure these at your office and have a lot of fun with that. All right, so if you're looking at the components of ConShort, here are five of the models that are fed into it. And for this particular example, we are looking at light snow spreading into southern Wisconsin from west to east. Uh, these five models have five different solutions about when the lower ceilings, when the, the IFR visibility here is, on, uh, is in the pink. So they have definitely five different ideas of the timing of that. And here are four different ideas as well, also led in, fed into on short four models. We can view them in the weather element group, but they're not part of con short. They seem to be a little too binary and didn't verify as well as the others, so we just didn't include them in con short. You can still see them. And they have timing issues as well. Okay, so the forecasters saw con short. They're making their 18Z tasks in the top left. That is what ConShort was giving them for 0Z. What their forecast ended up being was a little bit lower of sky grid. They did some extra model blending, and they thought, hey, you know what? I think the lower ceilings are going to come in earlier than what ConShort is suggesting. It turns out it actually was a good idea because the OBS grid showed the, low, the IFR ceilings already into our CWA at 0Z for this instance. All right, let's take a mixed precipitation event that happened at the end of December this year. There was even thunder snow with this event. We had accumulating sleet across southern Wisconsin and then over up to a foot of snow across our northern forecast area. So this was a wild event. Downtown Milwaukee was only supposed to get, well, the most recent forecast that afternoon said four inches of snow. They ended up with nine. Uh, that was with, because of some mesoscale vortex snow band off of Lake Michigan that hit downtown Milwaukee. But anyway, needless to say, it was a forecast nightmare. Here was the 
radar reflectivity at noon, we had snow spread into the whole southern Wisconsin early on in the event, and then later it changed over to sleet and then back to snow in the evening. So at 18Z, you, the forecaster is trying to make their forecast. Actually, when they're writing the 12Z task, they had con short avail available to them. And this is in the top left. What their forecast ended up looking like was very close to what Consort had. Um, and then looking at the 18Z OBS grid, that turned out to be a good decision. And Consort performed fairly well with IFR ceilings across almost the whole forecast area already at 18Z. OK, and moving ahead to 0Z. You can see that there's a heavy snow band already setting up in our northern forecast area. This whole area in sub southeast Wisconsin is sleet changing back into snow. All right, in the top left, when I'm generating the 12Z forecast, or the 12Z task, I'm looking at con short forecast for 0Z. As a forecaster, I did not stray very far from Consort. It was giving me really low ceilings. Consort does pretty well with the lower ceiling, ceiling situations in general. So, and also in the outer periods, well, how much value can we add to Consort? We don't actually know what's going to happen in all scenarios. Well, so that's kind of a best practice for the outer periods. Stick with Consort if, you, if you're not sure what's going to happen. Turns out Consort didn't help us very much for the for that far out period because the cloud bases weren't actually that low at zero Z, except in our southeast. Okay, moving forward to the 18Z TAF issuance, um, that forecaster stuck very close with Consort, which changed from the 12Z time period. And again, it verified, this time it verified better and the um, it worked out pretty well. If I look at stats and demand for just December 28th for this event, we verified quite well. Our POD was 0.758. Now, Jerry made some gridded verification available to everyone. And what this is showing is, you know, focus on the red outline boxes here. Um, that, that is showing that the forecaster ranked better than what Consort and some of our other models were saying. Um, the ones that aren't in black, just ignore them for this thing. Jerry runs some experimental models in the verification in the background, not as reliable. Bottom line for this slide, Consort was up there in the verification, but the forecasters beat it. And that's what we want to see. So now, moving more into verification. If we're using stats on demand, um, I made a graph of how the verification has been going at MKX. Um, the, we've only been using digital aviation services the last year, but you know we're going in the, in the right direction, improvement. But when we're talking about verification, one thing that has come to my attention recently, um, Matt Lawrenson, MIC at Green Bay, he made a graph for us that focused on the IFR, the difference of IFR frequency and how it, how our um, verification might depend on that. So what this is saying is the more frequently we have IFR events, the better our verification is. I know Matt's going to be talking more about this in the upcome, in the near future, and he's been making some IFR uh, normalized plots for various offices. So look for more on that. But what this comes down to is you should be using probably a large sample set when you're looking at verification. OK, so Jerry made verifying observations, uh, kind of like an OBS, OBS grid. And he had to make that in order to verify all the models on a gridded basis, right? So for this example, we can look at the light snow over southern Wisconsin and compare the METAR values to what came up in our OBS grid, cloud-based primary for cloud-based primary. You can see that the 1,700 foot overcast showed up at Madison. 700 was rounded to 800 at Waukesha. Um, 1,300 was rounded to 1,500 at uh, Milwaukee. And at Kenosha, we had it picked up on that 700 broken group. 
Um, so how Jerry makes this OBS grid is he's using the ASOS and AWAS stations in your area, but also he's pulling in like kind of a blend of the very short-term models in the background, and that's how he makes an overall picture of the OBS grid in order to verify your grids. He also made this slick verification webpage, and it's available to every one of you, all of your offices. When you go to the, your verification webpage, on the left-hand column, you'll see this aviation verification pop up now. And you'll be able to pull up certain time periods and which editor you're going to want to use. You can scroll down through your contingency table. A little more on the edit area. He has it set up so you can focus on your ASOS AWAS site verification, but you can also select it for your entire CWA, like all your points within it. We find that the verification is very similar when I compare the two here at MKX, but it's, you know, things for you to look at. Your edit areas are actually created in-house at your office um, for your TAF sites or wherever you would like them, ASOS, AWAS sites, etc. So that's a little bit configurable for you. One more thing, if you want to poke around and see everybody else's verification, you can. You just click on CRGMAT verification, and you can see what everybody else is doing. All right, so Jeff Craven ran aviation graded statistics for the period of eight months after we were well established into DOS. And what we found was the forecasters in the, in the short first six hours of the forecast actually performed better than Consort. That's exactly what we want to see. This means that the forecasters are getting to know Consort, getting to know when it works and when it doesn't, and they're adding value to the forecast. This is exactly what we need to be doing as forecasters. So we're really happy with these results. That's for the high T skill score. You can also compare the equitable threat score. Um, what this is showing is the Consort did outperform the forecasters in the outer periods of the task for the IFR category. And that just shows us, like, well, pick your battle. Know when you're better at Consort and when you're not. So that's why we kind of encourage you not to not to do a whole lot of editing in the extended unless you really don't like what's going on. So now I'm, I'm wrapping up the call. And what I just want you to know from this, this uh, webinar is to encourage you guys to give digital aviation services a try in your offices. There's strong verification to it. It does make your life easier when you're generating your tasks. And it does promote the consistency that is very important on a national and regional and local level. We do need your input and your feedback. We want to keep the DOS, uh, want to keep it going toward improving DOS. And uh, this is all going to feed into our central region fiscal year 17 goal of doing DOS operationally, um, making the grids routinely and running them from your running your tasks out of your formatter, sending your ceiling and visibility grids to NDFD and point and click. So what I mentioned earlier is that we have a, a shared Google Drive. Brian will be sending out that link um, today or tomorrow with the DOS recording of this presentation. And anyway, it's all going to be available in one place. What I did was I made five separate presentations with different titles or that describe what, what part of DOS you want to look at. I parsed it out just to keep the presentation shorter. These are just slide sets you can step through at your own pace. But they're going to give a little more detail than what you saw in this presentation today. Nothing that I could cover in one hour, like in those five presentations. So we also have a VLAB account set up for CR DOS, Central Region DOS. Um, there's a forum there. You can put your questions in there, and Jerry and I and Brian and Denny and whoever else is on the development team can get back to you. And also, people can see what you're asking, and then it's kind of a centralized location. A lot of people are going to have 
a lot of similar requests. So it's just a, a good way to streamline the request and feedback process. Um, you could also direct questions to Brian Hirsch, who can direct your questions to the appropriate people. But as usual, Jerry and I are both available by email and phone as necessary. We made a, a detailed Central Region DOS install intro. That was available with the tech note, but it's also in our CR DOS toolbox. That has written out detail of everything that's installed into your, your GFE with aviation services. Okay, and then credit goes to Patrick Eide from Bismarck, who made up this two-sided one-pager that kind of streamlines the DOS process, gives you something to look at out in operations really quickly. You can glance at what the procedures do, what steps you go through to make your task, and also maybe what some of the task format or rules are that are built in. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. We'll use this time to answer any more questions you guys might have. But we appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Um, as I uh, wait for a few folks to um, uh, raise their hand, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Steve Lack. Um, uh, Steve Lack is... Uh, 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 part of the uh, development folks at um, uh, at the Aviation Weather Center, and uh, Steve is actually on our call, and uh, maybe he could say just a few minutes um, worth about uh, about some of AWC's efforts um, looking at uh, digital aviation grids, and um, there are a lot of changes and more offerings that will be coming. So in addition to what we're doing. Uh, there'll be more. Um, there'll be more for us to look at over the next year or so. Steve, um, I've unmuted your line. Are you available? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, and like Brian said, I'm Steve Lack. I'm over at the Aviation Weather Center, and I basically coordinate um, the experiments that we run at the Aviation Weather Test Bed here in Kansas City. And we're actually in a really good place because we're co-located with Central Region Headquarters and the Operations Proving Ground which is a great relationship um, going forward for this digital aviation services on a, on a national level. So we've been working really close with Cami and her team, the Operations Proving Ground, Jeff Craven and Brian over in Central Region, and uh, also model developers at GSD and uh, EMC in DC, um, as well as as folks at GSD working with the TAF formatters and hazard services. So we really have a huge collaboration going on over here. So one of the big things we're looking at this winter in our experiment is some of the new guidance that we're going to be um, getting from some of the model developers. For example, um, from the RAP group out in Boulder, we're getting um, full 3D cloud fractions from the microphysics and radiative transfer schemes um, directly out of the model output. So we're going to assess those instead of using um, kind of RH methodologies that we've used in the past um, to try to figure out cloud bases and ceilings, et cetera. Um, we're also planning on getting 3D uh, cloud fraction from the NAM. And we're going to look at a lot at the LAMP Hermeld um, this winter as well that MDL is putting together because that showed great promise last summer. Um, especially in the western region where we were um, looking at fog and low stratus um, on the California coast. Um, the rest of the year basically is um, we're going to test a two-way interaction between the National Center, um, a the Aviation Weather Center, where we are going to try to um, do a national grid of ceiling, cloud base, sky cover, etc to serve sort of as a starting point for some WFOs that we're going to simulate in the operations proving ground. And basically what we want to do is try to test that two-way interaction where the national we might give a national center that might be a little broader brushed, um, but we'll, that will be derived from you know uh, our best model sources at the time, um, whether it be the LAMP, HER, CONSHORT, et cetera. Um, but we'll give that starting point pass it down to the local WFO for the uh, localized tweaks that we can't do on a national scale, and then that would become our final national product um, for ceiling invisibility with the idea that 
the tasks could fall out of that. Um, we also have an area forecast here that is uh, much like the TAF um, that would fall out of that, as well as our air mets for ceiling and visibility. So that's how we're trying to play with tying this all together, and it's very much a um, WFO, National Center, uh, headquarters kind of collaboration, and we're really excited to keep going um, forward with that. And i got to really thank Cami for um, really spearheading this effort. So that's my brief summary on what we're trying to do here at the Aviation Weather Testbed. And we are um, getting participants from the WFOs, especially for participating in the uh, uh, June experiment with uh, OPG and then in our experiment in August. So um, that's all I have. Thanks for the time, Brian. Well, thanks, Steve. And, and really, I don't know that that isn't anything that we haven't uh, had discussions about and um, that I haven't sent out any emails to uh, all of Central Region before, but it is um, uh, another thing to hear it from uh, uh, hear it from you. And this, uh, what uh, um, the, the Milwaukee set of tools that we have that Marsha's um, uh, just, just discussed here with us is really a starting point and we're going to be so far ahead when these other things just start to fall into place, um, whether it be the National Blender, um, whether it be uh, um, uh, some grids from AWC, um, improvements from GSD. All of these things are just going to fall right into what we're working on. Um, and some other folks may, uh, who, who aren't moving with the grids, um, they may have a, a, a large uh, step to take when uh, when we actually move uh, with with all of these other uh, instruments together, so um, so this is really very much in tune with with what we're doing. So um, Steve, I can't thank you enough, and I hope just because I caught you uh, uh, trolling our room, we we invited him actually, but just because I I, I caught you, I hope that doesn't mean that you won't. Uh, come back again. We do have additional questions, um, and I see hands uh, raised. Um, uh, Tom, I'm going to uh, unmute your line if you would uh, like to ask a question uh, on today's call. Thomas? Okay, I'll move along. Um, uh, Andy, are you there? Okay, and uh, uh, back uh, with the uh, group of folks with uh, Jeremy Martin. I had a question come up here uh, relating back to the uh, uh, five and a half hours notification of when the aviation grades are expiring. Um, could, could there be a little bit clearer explanation of what exactly happens at that five and a half hours? Are the, uh, the grids automatically uh, populated and published at that point? And is that five and a half hours uh, configurable for us um, so that we may possibly prevent, if somebody's in there working on the grids, um, the concern was that it may be uh, overwritten by the uh, automatic um, population of the grids also. So we're just looking for kind of a clarification and additional explanation on that. Yeah, I can clarify for you. Okay, so th between step, okay, there's step one, two, three, and four in our implementation process, right? The offices that are in step one and step two get aviation populate, essentially, run into the, run in the background. When your office wants to go into the experimental and be running aviation populate manually, then your ITO is the person that will switch you into that mode because you've got to turn off some program called aviation rerun. rerun. You've got to rerun the install script in order to get aviation check out of test mode. Okay. But now for the offices in step three and four, like we at MKX, um, let's say no one touched the aviation grids in the last five and a half hours. That was since the last routine TAF, TAF issuance. So we would get a banner that pops up saying, your aviation grids are old. If you don't choose to populate, or if you don't do anything with your grids right now, like if you don't publish new grids, then it's going to run aviation populate in the background. It, will it publish it? It will not publish the 
the grids that are run in the background, but it will run it and do the background QCing and stuff like that. Um, so if you're a forecaster and you're, you didn't publish any new grids within like that five minute warning time, then yeah, you're going to lose the grids, your 15 minute warning time, sorry, then you're going to lose the grids that you were working on. So you either, what you would want to do as a forecaster is get in, run aviation populate, save your grid. You have to publish. And you have to publish at least a portion of those grids in order to um, make sure that script, the, the automated script doesn't run. But that is the breakdown process of it. We forecasters here at MKX haven't found any problems with it. Sometimes we just aren't getting to the grids before that script is running, and really it's no problem. We just kind of let it run, and then we just go in and make our edits after that, um, and then rerun Aviation Finalize with what we have in there. Okay, and uh, uh, for reference, the two primary grids we're referring to here are the visibility and the cloud-based primary? That's correct. Oh, and then here's Gary. It'll, it'll also check the low-level wind shear, too. So it checks all three, and if any one grid in the whole time frame was touched, then published. It, it yeah published. Then it will not um, it will not do the populate. So it checks every single grid during the full 36 hours that the task would be valid for. And if any one during that whole time frame had been published, then it won't do anything. Okay, cool. That explains it all. Thanks. All right, well, um, uh, I still have uh, uh, Thomas Laferve and um, Jeremy Martin. Both of you are unmuted if you'd like to speak. Your hands are raised. Okay. Well, um, I see no other hands. Oh, I have one more. Uh, John at APX. Yeah, Brian, I just uh, had a, a question about um, the fact that we're starting this running these uh, running the grids every six hours. Is there going to be a future requirement to keep these grids updated on a more timely basis? Well, I think I can address that then, John. Um, currently, we have no requirements other than the enhanced short-term um, uh, requirements. The uh, grid consistency team is looking at that, um, but really if you choose not to do this at all, um, that's uh, that's uh, an office choice. So right now what we're doing is providing this as an, as an option for people. Um, what folks have uh, come back and, 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 and told us here in Central Region and in Eastern Region is that once they once they have to adopt the enhanced short-term grids, um, this uh, uh, bit of extra work then really makes sense because the taps can fall out of it and um, uh, and you're actually harvesting some rewards in terms of consistency and um, just kind of ease of use when you look at doing multiple offices, or pardon me, uh, multiple TAF sites. But uh, there'll be no requirement, um, uh, at least at least for the foreseeable future, um, though it is a, a goal. And as you can see from uh, headquarters and AWC's perspective, uh, we're going to get um, significant help in maintaining these grids uh, coming on uh, this year even with uh, uh, ceiling grids, um, national ceiling grids uh, coming on and uh, convective grids even coming on. So there'll, there'll be a lot that ties into this as we as we go down um, this road. Uh, so if your office chooses not to begin at this time, that's fine. Um, but once you get into it and you start having the TAF fall out of that, uh, I, th I think it'll be just like any of your other grids where you just start maintaining them to keep them fresh throughout the day. Did that touch on it, John? No, it did. I was just, we were just curious about um, just future workload issues in terms of trying to keep a, a, a number of grids updated 
at once during rapidly changing weather situations where you can have situations such as up here with lake effect where the, uh, the current models aren't really handling things very well um, and how much work we're going to keeping those grids updated. So I was just curious as to if there will be a feature requirement to keeping those grids uh, you know, relevant to what is occurring at the time. Yeah. Um, and let me weigh in on that right now, too. Yeah, go ahead, Marsha. Okay, I know so you have a lake, a, too. Yeah, from a forecaster perspective, you know, we've been doing this for a while. What our goal is for now, until there's any requirements in the future, is we get our, we grid, we make our grids every six hours routinely. If we have time, we'll do amendments with the grids, keep them updated. Um, those rapidly changing situations where you're going to be issuing amendments because you're seeing the visibility is falling because of lake effect snow or whatever, you know, we're treating that, treating the aviation grids the same way we do with ESTF and everything else. You got to get your, your main products out um, right away. You've, those are the timely things, such as your tasks. Amend it manually. And then you can get to the grids when you have time. One more thing that I didn't get to mention in our talk is maybe maybe when you implement digital aviation services in your in your office, you might need to examine how you guys divide up the workload. I know we made just some minor changes in our operations. The the uh, data desk HMT intern um, that that desk what. What they do is they handle our weather story, and that frees us up for doing kind of getting the TAP amendments ready at the end of our shift. Or um, we shed the marine duties to be with the long-term forecaster in the morning, so we can work on the have more time to work for the 18Z TAPs and even the 15Z amendments if we want. Um, we just made some very minor changes in our operations, divided up our workload. We, we do the short-term, long-term forecast forecasters, uh, and we just shuffle duties as necessary to handle whatever the workload is for that day. But yeah, and that is part of all in the experimental phase. Your office needs to find what will work for you. And and one one last thing I'd I'd like to add is that um, the tools that we have to do this with. Uh, today, uh, I was speaking earlier in terms of models and in terms of uh, gridded fields, which will be available to you all, and that those will change and and improve. Um, uh, we also are embarking on a team to uh, update AVN FPS. Um, maybe there should be a, a healthy component in GFE that uh, allows you to do this kind of short-term tracking and monitoring, and and then AVN FPS becomes uh, a slightly different beast as well. Um, but again, if this is the direction we go, uh, I from from here forward, I can only tell you that uh, everyone should rest assured that there are actually other things that are coming into play, which um, are to uh, to help us get this done. So. Um, when we, what we really want to do is to roll this out so that everyone has a chance to look at it. Everyone has a chance to start thinking in terms of um, how this might work best, um, and those enhancements will come as as we move on. Um, and and uh, so I, I do think there's a ton of room in the future. So, but that's a great question um, and one that we probably haven't well. Uh, well addressed in yesterday's call, so I'm glad you asked it today, John. Okay, we are 20 minutes past the hour. Um, congratulations, uh, congratulations, many thanks uh, to the Milwaukee folks for um, uh, sticking to the word and getting us in and out in an hour, and um, then uh, thanks for um, the healthy questions that we had throughout the call. Um, final call, looking for uh, hands raised. Anyone? Otherwise, I will call it going, going, gone um, with our thanks to uh, uh, Marsha and Jerry. Okay. 
I will make a recording uh, of this. Uh, yesterday's recording appeared to go well. I have high hopes for today. And we will provide this in a Google Doc or a VLAB link by the end of the week. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending today's call.